So, um, happy early Thanksgiving, everybody. Um, we are going to have lecture on Wednesday, um, but we won't have lecture the Monday after Thanksgiving. I'll still be on my way back. Um, so, uh, no lecture a week from today. Um, we, I will be happy to schedule a makeup. And um, one thought I had is, depending on uh, your availability and what you'd like to do, is to uh, have a makeup during the finals week, Monday of finals week. So, uh, let's see what they would that be. Um, here. So that would be the 12th is the Monday. No, that can't be right. Yeah, no, the, the 9th is. So the last day of class is um, December 7th. That's the Wednesday. And then the next week is the 12th. That's when your papers are going to All right. So that's the week of, of final exams. Uh, I don't know if many of you have final exams. Uh, finals week. Um, so we'll schedule that this room. I'll double check that it's available. Uh, so we'll just think about it. Okay. All right. So um, last time we talked about optical molasses and we talked about the Doppler limit, um, which was uh, quite simple to derive, thinking about the balance between cooling due to uh, the viscous force, which is balance at some point in detailed balance with diffusion due to the randomness of the spontaneous emissions. And that gave us the Doppler temperature. We talked about how in addition to giving uh, a viscous fluid, we can also make a magneto optic trap that combines the effects of radiation pressure with a restoring force. And I just wanted to just show you a picture if you've never seen uh, what a, a model looks like. Um, this is, let's uh, bring this up here. <clears throat> right. So this is uh, my friend Chris Helmerson in the background there. Uh, one of the, this was, uh, I think, the original sodium mod um, from Bill Phillips' group, or can't be more than a second generation of it. Um, but this is a picture you'll see all the time. If you Google magneto optic trap images, you'll always find this picture. This is such a cool picture. Uh, what you see here is, well, of course, sodium, this is not a false image, I don't believe. Sodium fluoresces at, uh, you know, yellowish temperature, uh, yellowish colors, 589 nanometers, I think. Um, so this is, this is six beam optical molasses shown here. And right in the middle is, is the ball of atoms in the molasses. And uh, this is the vacuum chamber um, with the, also you see the magnetic coils that are used in order to create the gradient of the magnetic field that we discussed. Last time, it gives us that position-dependent Zeeman shift in such a way that you get preferential uh, scattering as a function of position, as well as as a function of velocity. So that's pretty cool. You can actually see the little ball of atoms. It's about that size. You know, it's a, it's about. I mean, it sort of depends, I guess, on exactly the parameters. But I think a typical knot is about oh, it's about a half a millimeter in. Uh, diameter, and then there's scattering. You see the, I mean, these the fact that you see these beams is because there's a little bit of sodium vapor around, and that scatters some of the light into the camera. 
Because what is the thing you can see in the middle of the right picture? This thing? Yeah. That's it. That's your ball of atoms. Okay, I thought the vacuum chamber is open. The, the windows are. What do you mean? I mean. We're looking through the window into the vacuum chamber. Yeah, so that's pretty, pretty neat. There it is. There's your ball. And these days we call the ball of atoms the mott. Even though the mod is the trap, we always talk about, I, I dropped my mod. Well, you're not dropping the uh, apparatus, you're dropping the ball of atoms, as we'll discuss in a moment. Um, OK, so, um, so here we are in history, back at 1988. You were all very young then, maybe some of you are even uh, but. So, um, optical molasses was first demonstrated in Steve Chu's lab, 3D optical molasses, in 1985. And there were lots, you know, the MOT was uh, developed uh, and first demonstrated in 1987. But, and there were some measurements done to try to see whether uh, the, the simple Doppler cooling theory um, worked and seemed to work. The temperature that was measured in, in, the, in the molasses and uh, Stichy's lab was about the Doppler temperature. Um, so uh, in Bill Phillips' group, they wanted to you know, characterize molasses a little bit more carefully, and they were doing some experiments. And um, the, the way it was, the, the mod at that time wasn't quite the work, now it's the workhorse of all cold atom experiments. You start with the mod and then you do something else. But back in that time, they didn't they weren't necessarily working with the mod. What was done was, you know, we had 16 optical molasses. And for example, you know, we, had, we can load this uh, with a Zeeman slower and have uh, opposite molasses. Now, it was called molasses. It wasn't called optical baby oil. It was called optical molasses because it's quite viscous, even though it's not. A, optical molasses has no restoring force, and so eventually the atoms, just due to diffusion, will diffuse out of the region. But that spatial diffusion is quite slow. It's super sticky. It's optical molasses. Okay. Um, and so one of the ways to characterize the molasses is to look at the spatial diffusion coefficient. And that gives you a, a measure of um, the recoil effects of diffusion uh, and their balance due to the viscosity. And so experiments done in, in uh, Bill Phillips' lab in a, around, oh, I guess, 1987, 1988, I don't remember exactly when that was, uh, showed the spatial diffusion was uh, slower when the detuning resonance was bigger. You remember the Doppler theory. If for our two-level atom, we had the Doppler temperature. You detuned to the red, but only very slightly. You detuned by only a half of the natural line width, and that gave you the Doppler limit, the most cold temperature and the most viscosity uh, was when you were at that detuning. And it turns out that you get a Doppler temperature of a half a line width in energy units. So you detune bigger, farther, and you seem to get the thing having more molasses property. 
Um, so that was kind of curious. And so Bill and his group decided to do uh, a, a, a new temperature measurement to find out what the temperature was. Were we really getting the top of limit or what? Now, the way that how do you measure the temperature of these atoms? You're not going to stick a thermometer in there. Uh, I mean, you're not going to quill. You don't have enough collisions at this point. You know, with, you're, you're just going to heat it. You know, put your thermometer in there. You're just going to heat up those atoms with a piece of metal you throw in there. So it's not how you measure the temperature of, of this gas of atoms. The way it was done, what you really are doing is measuring the spread in velocities, right? Because the spread in momentum, uh, so you know, the temperature per degree of freedom, 1 half k Boltzmann times the temperature is equal to you know, the, the mean square momentum in some direction by, by the mass. Right, that's how we're measuring temperature. This, of course, is really the mean momentum is zero is the flux. So the average of the square is also the fluctuations. So by measuring the spread and momentum, you're measuring the temperature. Okay. So the way that I think it was done originally in Bell Labs was a, a, a technique called release and recapture. So you have your atoms in the trap, then you turn everything off, and the atom will ballistically expand because some of them have more momentum than others. And so the gas or the ball will spread out by an amount related to these fluctuations in momentum, this spread in momentum. And then you turn back the trap, you recapture, and you see what fraction of the atoms did you recapture. And by measuring that, you get a measure of the temperature. And when they did that in Chu's lab, they found the Doppler temperature with huge error bars. Why were there huge error bars? Well, there were huge error bars because it's kind of hard. The volume of the trap isn't very well defined. So you're not sure exactly how many atoms you're looking at. It depends on that volume. At least back then it was. How can you see how much it is? How many atoms there are? They, by measuring the amount of fluorescence you have. So remember that the rate of scattering photons is the number in the excited state in steady state times spontaneous emission rate. Okay? So by measuring how much, in a certain time interval, how much scattered light I get, knowing what this is and assuming I'm saturating so that I'm at, uh, I have half of the atoms in the excited state, then I measure, I can measure the atoms. It's actually a hard thing to do. So Bill and his group decided they were going to take, do, try a different approach. Instead of doing this release and capture, they developed a method called time of flight. Well, it's not a good they just, it's a well-known method, but they did it in this context to try to get rid of the uncertainties associated with what was going on uh, right at, in the trap volume. And so what they did is they, uh, instead of looking at what's, how many atoms there are in the trap, what they did is they set up a, they, with a cylindrical lens, they made a, a sheet of light. Okay. So here's my mod. Or actually, this case wasn't a mod. It was atoms out of molasses. <laughs> now you drop. I'm sorry. You turn off the molasses. What's going to happen? Well, you know Galileo was right. All objects fall to Earth at the same speed, whether they're an atom or a bowling ball. Uh, so, but of course, they. Uh, I mean, this is freshman physics. Depends on how you shoot the monkey out of. I mean, the. the uh, baseball before you the monkey. Some, some of them have positive velocity, some of them have negative velocity, some have this velocity, they have a spread of velocity. And so we get trajectories of atoms that fall to Earth. Okay? And then when they hit this light, 
they are, this light is resonant with the transition, say the D1 line or the D2 line. And then we have a little lens here. We collect this on a photo detector and count the number of photons that uh, are scattered by these atoms. Okay? And so what will we see? What you will see, uh, this is, you know, you're dropping these atoms, they've fallen through here. Depending on what you're measuring integrated over the distribution is the arrival time at the sheet of light. And that arrival time will depend on the momentum. Now the mean, the, the mean uh, average, uh, assuming the average, I'm sorry, assuming inside this trap, the average momentum, let's call this an x direction, assuming the average momentum is zero, which it wasn't actually in their original experiments, they gave it a little push, but that's a separate story. Then you would expect that the mean position, it'll arrive at a time, uh, you know, the, the distance is one half gt squared, if this is the distance above the sheet of light. Right? That's just special physics. So at that time, they'll, the, you should see the peak. But there is a spread in that arrival time. So a spread in arrival times translates into a spread in momentum in the x direction. So if everything had exactly zero momentum when it started, then they would all arrive at this time. Those that are moving downwards, when I turn it off, will arrive earlier. And those that are moving upwards will arrive a little bit later. And the spread of arrival times tells me the spread of momentum. So that's a very clean, very nice technique, and it's used all the time now. In fact, you could, if you like, um, also uh, put on, if you wanted, you can make a gradient in the magnetic field. If you put a gradient in the magnetic field in addition uh, to um, just the free fall, what you get is a Stern Gerlach apparatus, which, which would separate out different peaks of different arrival times depending upon their magnetic moment. So it's one way also not only to measure the temperature, but to measure the uh, magnetic um, sublevel distribution of atoms after they come out of whatever apparatus you have. All right, so with this technique, they measured the temperature and in, in uh, Bill's group, Paul Lett, Phil Gould, these guys back in the day, and they found that where the Doppler temperature for sodium is about 240 microkelvin, measure temperature after they optimized things as best they could, they found that the temperature was about 25 microkelvin almost an order of magnitude colder than the absolute limit that Doppler temperature should give you. And the Doppler theory is pretty simple. So this was a big puzzle. Because now everyone knows that, of course, the Doppler uh, theory was based on a two-level atom. And as Bill said later on, you know, there are no two-level atoms and sodium is not one of them. Um, we, you know, remember we had uh, 
we have all of the let's see have uh, equals let's look at the the D two line of of sodium. Yeah, minus three, minus two, minus four, zero, one, two, three. So this is the hyperfine structure with all the magnetic sublevels. Just thinking about the D1 line, I'm sorry, the D2 line of sodium. If we had, we said, if we had this pure sigma plus light, this would be a cycling transition. And that would be really pure two-level atom physics. If we could really have pure sigma plus and really be tuned that case. But that's not what we have. What we have is 3D optical molasses. And in 3D optical molasses, it's impossible to have a pure sigma plus light. In fact, the optical molasses configuration that was used Okay, and this is not thinking about a mot where I want to collect and have repumpers and all of that. This is just molasses. The configuration consisted of six beams, but the six beams were uh, so I had you know linear polarized light here, and so this is K say in the x direction. In the z direction, what was done was to make the polarization perpendicular to this polarization so that I could think about each direction independently. Because on first blush, but we'll get more detail about this, if I have orthogonal polarizations, well then there's no interference between the beams, right? Because you typically would think the intensity depends on E star E dot product. If they're orthogonal, then the intensity, I just add the intensities. So it, what was done actually was to have six beam molasses where each of the beams was perpendicular to the other. Uh, actually, so this one, let's say, is out of the board and this guy is horizontal. Okay, so it's my y direction. If you can, if you can get my um, perspective, all three beams were orthogonal to one another. Okay, and that was done uh, in order to make sure to think about each, think about this one D Doppler theory that we described, thinking about them as three independent directions, and we had to get laser cooling. Independently. So this, there is no cycling transition in this circumstance, right? I mean, if I even if I made any two of them sigma plus, then it's not sigma plus everywhere. Now, of course, uh, no one, everyone knew that really what I have, you know, having all these transitions going on that are allowed, depending upon the pi's and the sigma's and, and the different magnetic sublevels. But the thought was, look, the lifetime of all of these levels is the same, as we know. I mean, the branching ratio changed, but the lifetime is the same. So the thought was, well, you know, we're going to basically get the Doppler temperature. Maybe it'll screw up a little bit, but it won't be so bad. There was no thought that something by keeping all of these levels in this system is going to make it colder. It's more complicated 
you know, you make it more complicated, it usually doesn't work better. Um, and this was one of the first and only counterexamples of Murphy's Law. Um, the butter fell up. Um, so, now, why, how, what was going on? Well, um, when I have, when I think about the fact that uh, I have this kind of configuration where I have two important features that were left out of the original Doppler theory. One is that I have multiple sublevels. And the other that I have variations in the polarization of the light. Now, when we have that kind of situation, and we take these other clues, there's a few other clues that, that uh, we need to put together. One we discussed was that the cooling worked better farther off residence. That's what we said. In fact, this temperature was achieved at a between, I think, of about 10 line widths off residence. Um, moreover, the other thing is that what, what we found is that the um, temperature was very sensitive to B fields. So a, a B field that could cause a shift, a Zeeman shift, of just about a mega, even a megahertz, whereas our detuning is maybe um, tens to 50 megahertz, meant that the, what was going on was not just related to uh, how close I was to resonance and what was going on in the excited state, but depended upon the fact that there might be some kind of dynamics within the ground subspace or ground manifold. See, in the Doppler theory, we just had two levels. We had a ground state and excited state. And the only dynamical time scale that mattered was a spontaneous emission rate. But when I have all these multiple sublevels, there are new dynamical time scales. And this, of course, was well understood. Uh, but no one thought it could actually help this. And the important dynamics that happens in the ground state is what's known as optical pumping. So we need to do a little aside here and talk about the phenomenon of optical pumping. Optical pumping was uh, the subject of Cohen's Energy's PhD thesis. Um, so of course, they knew all about optical pumping like nobody's business, said they called them out parrots. And you know, there's a little a joke. If you read Bill Phillips' uh, uh, Nobel um, uh, lecture, uh, he says, you know, when we talk about this, we say, well, I, I kind of joked, oh, well, of course, there's always optical pumping, ha, ha, ha. And Jean Dalibard said, you, you know, Bill, in the Economar, uh, optical pumping is no joke. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, in fact, it was the whole story. So let's talk about optical pumping. So what is optical pumping? Well, optical pumping is um, the uh, manipulation of ground 
Um, downstate populations with polarized So, what do we mean by this? Well, we already talked about one example of optical pumping. Uh, well, let's come back over here. We talked about, remember, uh, we talked about the fact that when I, if I'm not purely on the cycling transition, that um, if I'm resonant near two to three uh, in my hyperfine levels, which is a loud transition, I can decay from two to one, and that population is optically pumped out of two into one. And it pretty much stays there because atoms that sit in these levels are in the dark because they're just so far off resonance when this was detuned like by Adeline. But, okay. So that's one example of optical pumping. But the other kind of optical pumping I want to talk about is not only about um, thinking about energy, but thinking about polarization and magnetic sublevels. So let's uh, think about, for a moment, um, a very simplified picture of our atom, ignoring the nuclear spin. Okay, let's think about the D2 line without nuclear spin. So we have the P3 halves and the S1 half. So J equals 3 halves gives us Four magnetic sublevels, and s equals one half. The j equals one half gives us two magnetic sublevels in the ground state. Okay. So suppose I tap this atom and I shine. This. There's no hyperfine to worry about for the moment. Let's say I shine sigma plus light on this sample. What's going to happen? Those are the allowed transitions, right? If I put sigma plus light on. And then the atom can spontaneously emit, which means it can go like that. And if it absorbs here, the selection rules forbid it from coming back. This is a cycling transition. Is that clear? So, What's going to happen in steady state in this circumstance? Suppose I started with uh, atoms come out of an oven, they're in a Boltzmann distribution, they have no magnetic field, some equal population in those two magnetic sublevels. What's going to happen uh, after I shine on this sigma plus light? Well, this guy, if it absorbs, it might come back down here, or it might go here. If it goes here, it'll just stay there. If it started in this state, it will just stay there. So in steady state, I pump all the population into here, and I polarize the atom. And that is a way of purifying the spin degree of freedom. In some sense, I've made the spin temperature of the system close to zero. Okay. So I can purify the quantum state and prepare a very pure quantum state this way. And that's been uh, an, a very important tool in precision uh, measuring precision spectroscopy from optical clocks to try to measure fundamental constants and so forth by able to prepare as well as possible a very pure quantum state. Um, of course, if I had sigma minus light, I would have the, uh, the opposite effect. Um, and I would pop everything from plus to minus. If I put on pi light, well, it sort of depends if I had pi light in this circumstance. I 
have all these possible transitions. Nothing is a cycling transition. But these rates are equal. And so at the end of the day, I will just get a 50-50 mixture, a completely mixed state of spin up and spin down if I had if I optically pumped with pi length. That's not true in a more complicated atom because it will depend on the branching ratios and the clutch gordon coefficients. But in this simple atom of a one-half to three-half transition, this is the kind of optical pumping that we see. Okay? So, optical pumping uh, involves transitions between the different magnetic sublevels. Let's think about the dynamics associated with optical pumping. So, um, <clears throat> all right, let's imagine, let's start with, let's for example, look at the case where I shine, I have somehow shined on my atom, thought of it in this simple picture as um, with sigma plus radiation. So we want to look at the quantum dynamics associated with these processes. Let's assume, as is important for what we know in the ultimate uh, laser cooling problem, we're not on resonance, we're detuned from residents by some amount delta, okay? So we want to calculate, now this is complicated dynamics. In this case, well, here it's four levels. I have to take into account these two levels don't participate because if I have pure sigma plus light. Um, so to do this, we need to take into account the spontaneous emission. Remember, we talked about this with the two-level atom we derived in some way the master equation for the density matrix associated with this system for the two-level atom. But now we're going to have this four-level system. Um, so let's look at this a little bit more, in a little bit more detail. So um, I'm going to draw here the allowed transitions firstly and write down the Clebsch Gordon coefficients associated with these transitions. So these are the Clebsch Gordon coefficients that you remember in our discussion earlier in the semester. There are clebsch gordon coefficients associated with going from the ground state to the excited state through absorption of a photon or emission of a photon that has a certain um, projection Q relative to the quantization axis, Q being plus one, minus one, or zero associated with sigma plus pi or sigma minus transitions. Okay? So those are the clebsch gordon coefficients written there for that particular case. All right. So now let us imagine that I shine on my sigma plus light. With my sigma plus light, I can only absorb on this transition if I start here, or on this transition if I start here, but I can spontaneously emit according to these different selection rules. So, in order to derive the dynamics, the first thing we did when we talked about the two-level atom is we wrote down what we called the effective Hamiltonian dynamics, which was just the, two, the dynamics associated with the dipole interaction, and then 
assuming a finite lifetime for these states, we put an imaginary part into the excited state eigenvalue, right? Remember that. So let's write this down. Let's look at, at this. Uh, so consider we have two coupled two-level systems. Here they are. We have the ground one-half, ground minus a half. excited a half, excited three halves. These two levels are coupled via sigma plus light. And then each of these levels are coupled to one another through the spontaneous emission. So let us begin by writing down the non- Permission Schrodinger equation. The non permission Schrodinger equation takes into account the dynamics other than the refeeding terms. Remember, we said if we wanted to put the refeeding terms, which ultimately we're going to have to do because population can be returned to these levels through optical coupling. So we're going to put that back in, but we do that at the end. So what do we have? We have the rate of change of the excited state in the rotating frame. Let's say the excited state uh, one half with respect to time is equal to I delta minus delta over So this is the detuning, and this is the lifetime. Remember, every state has the same lifetime, although it divides in terms of branch ratio, but the total lifetime is just gamma, or one over gamma is the lifetime. And then I have Rabi oscillations plus I, the um, So, what is given in these dynamics is the, this is the um, free evolution in the rotating frame. This is the decay. And then we have Rabi oscillations that couple from ground in m equals minus a half to excited m equals plus a half with a Rabi rate depending on that matrix element. Okay. And the ground state has no intrinsic lifetime. And so we just get the same thing here. Just drop that. Okay. So that's the effect of Hamiltonian uh, evolution. Let's do a little aside over here. This matrix element associated with the Doppler operator. Um, let's assume that we have pure sigma plus.
So let's imagine that my laser beam was polarized with pure sigma plus light. Then this matrix element is equal to uh, the Clebsch Gordon coefficient associated with going from the P3 halves or the S1 half to the P3 halves with M equals starting in M equals minus a half, ending in M equals plus a half, absorbing a sigma plus photon times the reduced matrix element. times the electric field amplitude, right? This is the Kleptoric coefficient associated with that transition. And this is what we call, I'm just going to call it H bar Robbie frequency for the reduced matrix element. If I assume, for, for the case, you know, this is just, if this were equal to 1, this would be the Robbie frequency. Okay, so, um, then I'm on the side here. So now we're going to um, look at this in a very particular case. The case for which we saw the lowest temperatures. And that was the case in which the detuning was big compared to the line width. And moreover, was big compared to the Robbie frequency. So we're going to look at dynamics when this is much, much bigger than omega dot. Or omega dot squared. What does that mean? Well, we could look at this equation. This is an ODE. You can look at the formal solution to this ODE. If this is a much, 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 much more rapidly varying function than this, then what one, can, what will, one will see is that the dynamics of this variable is slaved to the slow dynamics associated with this variable, because this variable evolves slowly. This is the Robbie frequency. This is assumed to be a slow variable compared to this. And that solution is what we call adiabatic elimination. That is to say, the excited state will adiabatically be slaved to whatever is happening with respect to the slow variables. In this approximation, we can then just solve for this under the assumption that this very rapidly reaches a steady state, because this is a huge variable, gamma is big, and we get in the adiabatic elimination that the excited state probability amplitude is approximately equal to um, the uh, clebsch gordon coefficient times the Robbie frequency minus I Robbie frequency over Q divided by I delta minus gamma over two times the ground state in any half. So the key point here is that when I'm far off resonance, the um, excited state population or the excited state probability amplitude is not after a short time is not an independent variable, but is tracked to what is ever going on in the ground state. Try it. Do a formal solution to this ODE.
that doesn't, does that work if S is on the order of 1? Or no, because remember, S is the ratio of this squared to that. Yeah, yeah. So this is equivalent to saying, as we will see, the saturation parameter is tiny. It's the same thing. Because the saturation parameter is this square over that. So. All right. So let's plug that back in now over here. And what do we see? Uh, this then is equal to the square, I have the same Clifford coefficient, now I have the square of the Clifford coefficient. I have the Rob frequency squared divided by four. Times I delta minus two C G minus a half. So under this approximation, in which we adiabatically eliminated the excited state dynamics, slaved the ground state, we have in this approximation an equation for the ground state probability amplitude. What do we see? What it says is that there is a real part and imaginary part associated with the, this rate. So if I, multiply, if I multiply top and bottom by the complex conjugate, what I get is minus I times Let's see how we interpret this. What if this term were not there? Well, I mean, actually, we can look at this solution even with that there. What we see is that if I looked at the evolution of this probability amplitude as a function of time, it's just exponential exponential with a phase that depends on uh, this, uh, this coefficient. I'll just, uh, uh, I'd like to find a shorthand, but I don't have one in my head, so I'll write it all out. see from this expression times the zero, what it is at times equals zero. There is an oscillating phase and there is a decay. What is this oscillating phase? Well this represents, I can think about this as a shift 
in the ground state energy due to the interaction of this atom with the labor field that is detuned from resonance. This is e to the minus i sum delta v over t, t. And this is e to the minus i sum gamma over 2, I'll call it, because it's the amplitude. Did no i? We have decay and oscillation. What is this term? Do we recognize this? This is the Rabi oscillations. Well, it's not Rabi oscillations per se because it's just we're not going from one. Notice that this probability amplitude, all that's happening is it's gaining a phase. Of course, some it's amount of probability amplitude is also decaying. It's just, this is not kind of the probability for a state, for one of the states. It is, but that probability would not change because this is e to the minus i. Yeah. So that yeah. probability does not change. It's just the light shift. It's the light shift. The, it's the shift in the ground state energy that we thought about in many different ways. One, we thought about it as a polarizable particle, and then it had polarizability, and we looked at that energy shift. We also looked at this, in, I mean, it's just our two level problem that we solved, you know, one of the homework problems. We looked at the shift in the ground state energy. And that light shift depends on the square of the Klebsch Gordon coefficient, right? So this term here uh, is the light shift. What is this? Well, you remember we had, when we thought about the two level atom, we talked about the rate at which photons were scattered. And the rate at which photons were scattered depended upon the fraction in the excited state times the spontaneous emission rate. This is the fraction in the excited state. So this gamma here is related to photon scattering. Now, this is not the whole story, because as we discussed, in addition to um, the decay in the effective Hamiltonian formulation, we also need to include refeeding. We're not going to get that out of the effective Hamiltonian. So we need to put in one more step here. So the rate of change of the population or the number of the atoms in, the, uh, in this particular level is given by according to the effect of Hamiltonian plus the refeeding terms. So what are the refeeding terms? Well, I can refeed if I if I'm I'm talking about this transition. I can refeed by uh, decay back. It's the only way I refeed, right? I I, I I can't get here, so I'm not going to refeed from this. In this case, I only refeed due to emission back. So that's the number in the excited state with n equals a half times gamma. That's my receiving term. Happens at that rate. Oh, not quite. I have to have the branching ratio, right? So I have that same Klebsch Gordon coefficient again.
Looks good. All right. So this term, this term terms, if I plug this in, the phase, as we were just discussing, does not affect this light shift as far as the optical pumping is concerned, does not affect the rate of change of the population because we just said the square of this amplitude is one. It's only this term that affects the change in the population. So from this we get minus uh, that same horrible tetrawatt coefficient again. Excited state. Well, we do we still have that up here. Here it is. So I'm going to get uh, that same. Actually, I'm going to get it to the fourth power now. Okay, lots of algebra here, but let's get to the physics. We have our transitions here. We said that this guy, we get a light shift, and we get loss of population, and then we can refeed. The difference between how much is being lost and how much is being refed is whatever goes into this other transition. Because you remember that it must be the case that the square of these two Klebsch-Gordon coefficients This is the Klebsch Gordon coefficient associated with the sigma plus. And this is the Klebsch Gordon coefficient associated with the pi. So what I, I can do is take one of these guys, write this, this, you know, this was squared, take this as equal to 1 minus that. That cancels out one term. And what I'm left with at the end of the day is the result I really wanted to get to. This derivation shows us that population, when I put on the sigma plus light, population in the m equals minus one half state is leaving. Ultimately, will decay to zero. 
it will decay all the way to zero because of optical pumping. There's no eventually, I mean, it could fall back, but eventually it will all end up spin up. And the rate at which it does that depends on the clitoral coefficients. As the product of the square, in this case, this clitoral coefficient squared was one third, and this clitoral coefficient squared is two thirds, and so the rate is the famous minus two ninths times the scattering rate. So, the moral of the story from all this mess is the following. If I shine on polarized light, I will optically pump and change the magnetic sublevels. The rate at which I do so depends on what the polarizations are, what the clitoral coefficients are, and the characteristic rate at which the rate of optical pumping is characterized by the scattering rate. And the scattering rate depends on the intensity and the detuning, as well as gamma. And if S0 is small compared to 1, then this is, is much, much smaller than gamma for S0 small compared to 1. So what? Uh, was understood uh, was that there was a new internal time scale that was important in laser cooling. In our two-level approximation, there was one important time scale in terms of the decay, and that was gamma. But if I have to think about optical pumping, there's a new dynamical time scale the time scale at which optical pumping happens. And that time scale depends not only on gamma, but also on delta. Moreover, what we saw over here is that in addition to optical pumping, there's other dynamical scales associated with the ground state. The light shift. So I need to think about if I'm going to think about laser cooling with multiple sublevels, I better think about the effect of the light shift and the pumping rate and the interplay between them. So now we have our tools to think about what the heck is going on and why we were able to beat the Doppler temperature. So historically, what happened was they measured these temperatures. Everyone knew there were lots of these levels. Something was going on. Certainly, it had to do what was going on in the ground state because the experimental evidence pointed to that. Small Zeeman shifts in the ground state had huge effects on the temperature. It, things happened. You got colder temperatures when you got farther off resonance. So it was all what was going on in the ground state. So the group, Steve Chu's group, you know, they knew how to do this modeling, you know, even though they're in the lab, they understand all this physics and it's math. They, they put in the kitchen sink. They put in all the levels, ran a master equation, did it and said, yeah, it, it, it's cold or it works with a master equation. Now, of course, it wasn't quite like that. They, were, they had physical insights into it, but it was extremely complicated. I mean, we drew all those levels. You really didn't have the essence of it. And to me, this is an example of how theoretical physics works and doesn't work. Just modeling everything in the kitchen sink may 
be able to allow you to fit your experiment, it won't necessarily give you new insights into how you should think about the physics going on inside your experiment that maybe would give you new directions for new kinds of experiments you want to do. So, at the same time, Dalibard and Komatuji, John Dalibard was, was Komatuji's student, I believe, at the time, said, look, let's boil this down to the essence. Instead of thinking about sodium with its umpteen levels and 3D optimal acids, let's think about the key physical ingredients. Multiple sublevels. Polarization, variation. light shift. And they said, let's look at, instead of looking at 3D molasses, let's look at the simplest possible model we can create to see whether it will give us sub-Doppler temperatures with these ingredients. So what they did is they looked at this atom. They imagined the simplest atom that had multiple sublevels, just two in the ground state, instead of everything in the world, the one we just talked about. So we have our, the model, due to continuity, <coughs> is that the total intensity, as we just described, the total intensity as a function of position is constant. There's no standing wave here because these polarizations are orthogonal. However, the way in which that intensity is distributed in different polarization states varies as a function of position. That is to say, these configurations have variations as a function of position in the polarization. They are said to have polarization gradient. The polarization of the light changes, as we will see, as a function of time. I'm sorry, as a function of position. And that is what is now known as polarization gradient cooling, which was the mechanism to beat the Doppler limit, so-called sub-Doppler cooling. 
intimately related to polarization gradients and optical pumping. So we will pick this up next time and give the detailed description of how that works and the famous Sisyphus mechanism for cooling. All right?